the draft to opt-outs. But on the defensive line, they're keeping their main guys. But I want to throw it over to you. What do you think is worrying you the most about Oregon right now? Well, I think I'm going to let you talk more about the pass rush since I just got to uh, to throw my my ring in the, my hat in the ring for that one. I think Oregon's running game is the scariest thing about the offense, and, and you talked about that earlier as well. C.J. Burdell is probably the best uh, running back returning in the Pac-12, one of the best in the country. I mean, he's got 2,238 career yards, and that's in just two seasons. I mean, he's going to have a shot at being one of the best running backs in Oregon history, particularly if he sticks around for a senior season. Last year, he averaged 6.2 yards per carry. And even if you have a good offensive line, that's extremely impressive for a running back uh, over the course of the season. And it's not just him either. They have Travis Dye, and uh, I'm going to mess up his name, but uh, Cyrus Habibi Likeo, I think I got it right. He had 10 touchdowns last year, a Palo Alto native. Um, and so they have depth and they have talent at the running. And we know their offensive line is such an emphasis for Mario Cristobal. This guy was a former offensive line coach. That's where he got his start in coaching. And so if Oregon's offensive line is as good as it was last year, you know they've got great guys to run behind it, and it could be a long day for the Sanford defense. Because we know if a team is able to run all over you and have a good defense, very difficult to win those games. You fall behind early, you're playing catch-up, then you start to turn the ball over. So besides the pass rush, and specifically Kayvon Thibodeau, C.J. Verdell in the running game is absolutely what scares me most. And we know that that formula of a strong defense and a great running game works because Stanford did it for so many years to near perfection, where it looked so easy for Stanford to control the clock and win games like that. But yes, going back to that defensive line, Thibodeau, Scott, who's a senior, has 37 career starts, which leads the entire Pac-12. Twice he's been an honorable mention for all Pac-12 by coaches. I played over a thousand career snaps, and then Foliu, who's also projected to start, played in 36 games, has made 16 starts. So that's a lot of starts returning on the defensive line for Oregon, which lost a lot of depth other places in the defense. They lost 59 defensive back starts, 84 at linebacker, but just 27 on that defensive line, which is why I'm harping on it so much because Stanford's offensive line has made a lot of strides. They're a lot better now. I think we're going to see that. But this is a huge test in the first game of the year after they haven't really seen this violent play of a live game in a long time, how they're able to protect Davis Mills, how they're able to get holes for the running backs. I'm not sure if we're going to see it. And this is a great test for week one. Really exciting, I think, for Stanford to actually be able to measure up in this, right? Because we'll talk about this, but Stanford doesn't have much to lose in this game, right? They're a 10-point underdog, at least. If they lose by seven, it's not a big deal. That's what they're supposed to do. So this is an opportunity for Stanford. I think they're going to be able to play with a little bit less weight on their shoulders and actually be able to perform better than expectations this week. I absolutely agree. And, you know, I see that line and I say hammer Stanford this week. And there's a lot of reasons, and I think we're going to go into more of those. But I think Oregon's being significantly overvalued this season. I think that they are an overrated team. And the reason is it's a similar to the LSU principle um, from early this season. LSU had a fantastic season last year, probably the greatest college football team in history. But they lost like 18 of 21, 22 starters or something like that. I mean, they had a ridiculous amount of production lost, and, and not just to graduation and NFL draft declarations, but also to opt-outs. And so we just assume because of the talent level on the roster, they're going to be right back there in the same position this season. Well, they come out and lose to a Mississippi State team who has looked awful since. And, and then they just get destroyed by Auburn last week. LSU is a totally different team. Is Oregon going to fall off the cliff like that? No, I don't think they are. But I do think it's fair to wonder uh, how it's that is losing so much of what made it great last season is, is just being picked to, to pick up right where they left off. I think Mario Cristobal is in the course of building Oregon into a national title contender. But they're not there yet. And I really think that this is a potential step back season. And if I'm wrong, if, if I'm wrong and Oregon is able to be a national contender this year, that says so much about the program Chris Ball has built up because that means you're able to sustain those losses in an Alabama or Clemson style fashion. But I don't know if they're ready to do that just yet. And I think we've talked about it a lot. Stanford's four and eight season last year was an outlier. Now, it might not have been a severe outlier, 
Stanford was probably more like a six and six team. They're probably more like an eight and four program, but the four and eight was an outlier due to injuries um, and, and some just injuries in key spots at bad times and some games that got away from you. And we've talked about it ad nauseum, but that's not the kind of team that Stanford has returning this year. They have a team returning that is capable of beating anybody in the Pac-12, and Oregon is no exception there. So I think the thing that scares me most about Oregon as it pertains to preseason expectations is just the general talent level of the roster. In the 24-7 sports team talent composite, they have the 12th most talented roster in college football, second most in the Pac-12 behind USC. That doesn't tell you everything, but it does tell you they're recruiting at an extremely high level. I mean, they had the number seven class in 2019. They signed the, na- the nation's top two linebackers last year. Mario Cristobal is building something special. But if he's not there yet, then Stanford has a great chance to go ahead and knock the Ducks out of playoff contention in week one. And that's entire, a completely reasonable assertion to make, right? Because you would never say a team with a brand new offensive line and a brand new quarterback should be picked to run the table. That's not the way it works in college football. It takes a while to build up because everybody goes through this phase where they learn on the job. That's what college football is. But predicting a bounce back or a, a setback season for Oregon seems totally realistic, especially when you look at how young of a team Oregon is. 74% of their roster is underclassmen, which is the highest number in the FBS. Stanford, of course, is fourth in the entire FBS at 71.6%. So they're both very young teams. And from that, what makes me worried for this game is obviously that Oregon has been recruiting at a much higher level than Stanford has for the past four years, right? So that's what makes me worried is that they have a higher talent level, which is what you're just pointing to in that 24-7 composite. But at the same time, we see that both teams are young. So both teams have an opportunity. And that's what makes me excited for this game and thinks that there's something could actually come out of it in terms of positives for Stanford that they could surprise a lot of people, right? Because... Preseason rankings don't mean much. We all know that. We all know it's kind of ridiculous to assume based on what the team was last year. We, we've, we've been over that many times. But for Stanford to potentially have a good game against a team that is ranked number 12 goes a long way towards what the end of season uh, kind of results are going to start looking like. And one other thing about this game, Alton Stadium is probably the scariest play, place to play in the Pac-12, uh, maybe outside of, of going to UW. But it's a really good year not to have fans in the stands. I hate that that's the way it is. I hate that we are in this COVID era. Um, but uh, if you are going to have a, a schedule that sets up nicely for the Cardinal in a fan-less environment, uh, it is going to both Oregon and Washington without those fans in the stands because it is different. Now, I've looked at the weather. looks like it's going to be cold, potential precipitation um, on Saturday. So that could be something that Stanford is very much not used to. Lord knows it's not raining in California right now. And uh, it certainly hasn't been cold either. And so that that's honestly the most worrisome thing about going on the road, beyond just also taking on a different uh, city and traveling in a COVID era. Uh, that That's also a worry. But it's not a true road game. And so I think Vegas is, kind of, this is a true road game. And they're treating it as a true road game where the home team is a true top 10 team. And I don't think they are. And I don't think it's a true road game. And so I think, uh, you know, we're, we're not a betting show, but if we were, I'd say go ahead and take Stanford uh, and put the house on. 